Welcome to Mysterious Goings On. We're going to get right to the show after these messages. Hi, this is Cassandra Lane. I'm the author of We Are Bridges, a memoir. You're listening to Mysterious Goings On with Alex Greenwood. You know, listeners, I think that economic inequality and uh, um, a lot of is is at the basis for a lot of the issues in our society worldwide. I think that um, a good portion of the blame for that goes to the fact that we probably don't do a great job of educating uh, the next generation about things like financial liber- literacy and civics, and those are some pet. Um, causes of mine, like I think a lot of you regular listeners know, and that's why I'm excited to have somebody on Mysterious Goings On who I actually had on my sister show PR After Hours and got so, (laughs) I got so riled up speaking with him because he's so interesting and he's doing all the things that I wish all of us could do. And that's why I'm really excited to have him on the show. He's Luke Homan. He's founder and CEO of First Root, a benefit corporation devoted to creating great economic equality. He's a serial entrepreneur. His last company, I believe it's pronounced Contineo, was an enterprise software company that helped global companies manage investment portfolios using participatory budgeting. Well, now Luke is leveraging that experience he gained working with some of the world's largest companies to help prepare our children for their future by bringing participatory budgeting into schools to teach financial literacy, civics, and design thinking. Uh, Luke, you already have been so generous with your time, and you work very hard, I know, but thank you, thank you for joining us here also on Mysterious Goings On. Alex, thank you so much for having me. Uh, You know, this is my, uh, it's either candy or kryptonite, right? It's the thing that, uh, it's dark chocolate or kryptonite, right? It's the thing that you can't say no to. And when someone like you gives me a chance to spread the word about participatory budgeting, about all the things that you and I care about, financial inequality, how uh, financial literacy contributes or detracts from that, how to help people succeed. I, I, we're, you know, we're, we're brothers from a different mother and uh, <laughs> in this cause. And, and there's a lot of us out there. So being on the, on the show is a great honor. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you again. Um, and folks, uh, by the way, folks, if you, uh, I should just say this, by the way, if I'm tripping over my tongue a little today, I just had emergency dental surgery this morning for a cracked tooth. So uh, Luke, I didn't even tell you that before we got started. So I, I feel myself tripping here and there, but uh, we'll get through it. Okay. Uh, but if you do want to hear that first <laughs> interview with Luke over at PR After Hours, fear not, go to mgopod.com and there's a link in the show notes or they should be in the show notes Um wherever you're getting this podcast but uh, check that out if you want to get started there and hear that because you can just hear me my level of excitement with everything he's discussing rising through the whole thing so it's it's pretty great luke 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 let's talk about first root shall we um i'd love to know the genesis of it and what is it supposed to be doing to help these kids in the next generation Well, let's start with what participatory budgeting is just to ground everyone. And then let's talk about how it transforms a couple of really important aspects of society. And then from there, you can grill me about, well, why does that matter? Like, why should we care? Good. So participatory budgeting is a democratic or egalitarian process in which a group of people decide how to spend or invest shared resources. Now, that's a very abstract way of saying we give kids some money and we help them as a group decide how to spend it. A concrete example would be uh, one of our pilot customers was uh, Hegel Elementary School in Madison, Wisconsin. And the, the three fifth grade classrooms were each given $500. And they started to create ideas of how to make the school better because they were graduating and they wanted to, in a sense, give their fifth grade school present. 
what was really cool is when the kids were talking initially, they said we wanted to have the classroom separate, but then the kids chose to join forces and have one $1,500 pot that the kids could invest together to make the school better. Now, notice there's a couple of things here. First, it's a structured process. The kids are in control of the planning, who gets to you know, be involved and how do we structure it. The kids are doing the proposals. The kids are shaping the proposals into specific things that can be voted on. Now the adults step in a little bit after the proposals have been refined just to confirm that it's something that is the aligned with the school requirements and the school guidelines. For example, most of the times you will not put policy changes in the hands of kids like no homework <laughs> or, <laughs> you, you know, right. And, and you also want to have the adults there. So, you, you know, the, one of the fifth graders is like, we want a new baseball field. And the adults were like, that's a great idea but you can't get that for $1,500. So how do we organize that uh, so that we can make improvements if we want to, to the baseball field. And then when that process is complete, the students then vote, which is a very exciting process because now they've seen their proposal ideas get put into a ballot, the students vote and the school commits to funding and implementing what the students pick. So it's it's this amazing process that teaches financial literacy because there's a limited budget. You have to figure out how much something costs. You have to figure out the total cost of ownership because if you buy something like a 3D printer, you might have to buy supplies for the 3D printer and you get a chance to talk and communicate with the students about those things. And the students get to experience democracy in action because this is a democratic process that uh, in includes like who benefits, et cetera. So let's talk about what the students selected. Uh, three things stand out. One is they got a new tree that they planted. And what was exciting about the new tree was that it was more expensive than their budget. And they figured out how working with some of the parents, the, one of the parents was an arborist and he donated a tree. So they learned that you can have big ideas if you can find other ways to get the community involved in implementing them. They also bought soccer nets for the uh, new soccer nets for the for their soccer field and the soccer goals, and they bought fidget toys. And I thought that was hilarious that they wanted some fidget toys for their classroom. <laughs> so it was really fun and it was really great. And this process does another thing that is related to what you talked about in the beginning, which is we have two aspects of financial, um, or two, two contributing factors to financial inequity. One is a, a knowledge based. It, it's how do I use money effectively to accomplish my goals? And the second is structural. Some of the inequities that have occurred are structural. And to change a structural inequity, I have to have civic engagement because I want to change laws, I want to change rules, I want to change opportunities so that I can create equality. For example, uh, many decades ago, we had redlining where, mm -hmm. you know, banks simply wouldn't make loans to um, uh, people of color and in, in, in certain neighborhoods. So it was a structural mechanism of creating inequality. Well, we've removed redlining, but now we have to create uh, and look for those opportunities to create structural solutions to inequity. Yeah, yeah. The whole, the whole thing that I that really attracts me to what you're doing here is that it's not just about literacy. It does encompass the whole thing, as you said. You know, you have the civics aspect of it. Um, one of the things that I think is really dangerous right now, and we're seeing this right now in this country, and I'm. I, Please, I promise I'm not going to try and go political here because we're trying to talk about you know your organization and we're trying to get people on board. But, but I do see a danger in that there's polling out there that says young people, millennials, a lot of them think uh, you know uh, democracy is not necessarily a great way to go. Um, and and, yes. and I don't and I can believe I can understand that. I at first when I first heard it, I could not understand. I was like, what? But now I do because what they see is is a lot of dysfunction. 
Uh, what they see is a, a lack of opportunity to participate. Uh, and I think what they see too, it, particularly on the financial end of that, is a lot of folks that age, they're just struggling to get by and get out of their parents' basement, if I'm being simplistic, if I may, you know. But so I, I'm wondering, Luke, if if this became, if, if PB became a thing where um, worldwide, where it really had got some purchase, so to speak, pardon the pun, do you think that it could, within a generation, turn this around? I do. Uh and, and I'm not just saying that because I'm an entrepreneur promoting a company. Uh, I believe in research for the work that I do. I, I do think we need to, to take good ideas and study them. So let's take the financial literacy part and let's just talk about personal finance. The, one of the questions is, does education and personal finance actually make a difference? Or is it just like taking, ex, you know, excuse the re relationship, and I know I'm going to get a lot of flames, but it's actually, if you look at the data, the most wasteful subject we force kids to take in school is a second language. When the, the, really? like, yeah, second languages have virtually no positive correlation to future success or actual use. So you, you take, you know, I took French in high school because I had to. Right. Um, uh, it, it has had no impact in my life and it is a huge cost. Now, I'm not saying that other languages are unimportant. So we, you know, I don't want to be like the crass American for the global listeners who are, are denigrating someone else's cultural language. I, that's not what I mean though at all. I'm just saying that in the vast majority of cases, a, a forcing people to take a second language, just it's wasting money. It's not correlated to any, and, and, and I'm willing to, to base that debate with someone, not on their opinion of how important language is, but on the actual data that studies well, what happens when kids take a second language in their adult life? How does it how does it improve? How does it change? Well, that's not true with personal finance. With personal finance, we've got the Federal Reserve of the United States who've done studies on the impact of personal finance education. And they did a controlled study because uh, they were able to identify a state, Texas, that had a, uh, they didn't have a personal finance mandate and they had surrounding states that did, and then they tested the differences in performance of the various states. And what they found after Texas put in place a personal finance uh, requirement was that students who went through a personal finance course had 15 to 18 higher points uh, in their credit score and mm -hmm. were 5% li less likely to declare bankruptcy. Wow. And then they calculated the social benefit of having 5%. Now, 5% doesn't sound like a lot. Right. But when you multiply 5% over the number of students who graduate from Texas high schools every year as seniors, that was 40,000 fewer bankruptcies a year. Now, just think in your mind that the social cost of a person who goes through bankruptcy, it's enormous. Yeah. It's almost in some places it's it's practically irrecoverable. Yeah. So now this is really exciting. Okay, this is this is really interesting, really exciting. So we know that personal finance education does create positive, sustainable, beneficial outcomes in students' lives as they become young adults and 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 uh, adults in society. The second piece of research is from Arizona State University, who studied, are the students who uh, participate in a participatory budgeting program more civically engaged? And they are. Students who go through a participatory budgeting program, they register to vote, they get involved in their communities, and they do vote. And I tell people this all the time. I do not care if you're Democrat or Republican or Libertarian or Tea Party. What I care about is you are a citizen in a democracy. Now, different democracies around the world practice citizenship differently, but we all expect citizens to be engaged, right. to vote, to, to learn enough about the issues so that they can make an informed choice. 
And we have too, um, uh, too frequently uh, stopped supporting civic education and civic engagement in our schools. And it's what you said earlier. Why would a student in our society believe that civic engagement is a good thing when they look at a completely dysfunctional Congress, when they see, for example, the inability to fix their crumbling infrastructure. And these kids are growing up uh, driving cars and driving on roads that our generation, the older generation has abandoned. Mm -hmm. And so you're actually starting to see not just a backlash. I recently saw some data that says uh, there's not just a backlash against civics, there's actually a backlash against boomers. And I can't speak if you're a boomer, I'm a boomer. Right. And so uh, it's frightening because they're like, you've abandoned our generation and y- your, your selfishness, your lack of citizenship is, is causing us to have to do the cleanup. Except some, like you said, a lot of the students are like, it, they, they've checked out and we yeah. can't have, a, we can't survive a democracy where people are checked out. Yeah, I'm Gen X, by the way, just on the record here. And we feel that we got, you know, we all have our issues, right? Gen Xers have a little issue with the boomers and with the, we just feel like we got totally squished. Um, but that's okay. That's our own fault, I guess. You know, I, I'm a, uh, I'm pretty into Professor Scott Galloway. I don't know if you've heard of Scott. Uh, yeah, he's so. awesome. Isn't he great? Okay. So you are, are you aware then what he says, though, is what we're doing in this country is um, he believes we're investing in corporations and not people. He's, he believes that uh, that the young people um, have done some things that we can't even fathom, like gamify investing on an app, um, which he has issues with for a variety of reasons. But for the larger picture, but what Scott talks about that I, I happen to agree with is that um, the United States seems very consumed with taking care of people who already have plenty of money. Um, for example, during lockdown during during this COVID situation, um, huge amounts of money were given to businesses and, and the wealthy to ensure that they held on to and grew their wealth, whereas just small amounts were given to the next generation, um, which I think is just creating this feedback loop with them that we're already discussing where, yeah, like you said, checked out. That's perfect. I mean, I got a 12 year old daughter here. I don't want her checked out. We, we talked about this last time, Luke, about yeah. how I got her a civics uh, curriculum for lockdown. I mean, we did civics for, for eight months. Right. So I, I don't mean to pontificate. I just mean to say, I think, I think you're getting at this. Um, but I guess my concern is, is really not the students at this point. It's the parents trying to make them understand what, what you're up to here. Well, it, it is. I, it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, I've just been doing some research on how I go to market as part of our company. Mm-hmm. And you and I talked a little bit about this, but the, you know, the question is who to get involved and how, and I'm working on our, you know, influencers and stakeholder map and buyer personas and things like that. And parents are so critical to this process, but it's, it, it's unclear what role parents should really play in this process. Right. And I don't want to mean that that's a pass on parents, but not every parent has the ability to do what you did. Like I got my daughter involved in civics because especially with the impact of COVID, we know that, you know, low income and minority and and moderate, low to moderate income parents, minority parents, they don't have the ability to have that kind of investment in time. So we got to get the schools involved and we have to have the schools really look at the investments that they're making and what we're teaching our kids as as we make this transition from fact-driven education, which is becoming less meaningful when I can look up a fact on uh, the internet, right. and critical thinking and life skills education, uh, right. like civic engagement, because civic right. engagement requires more than just, and I don't know if we talked about this enough the last time, but when I think of a life skill, and I think you and I should to break into this, um, because this is part of, you know, mysteriousness that we want to demystify. Let's <laughs> just, do it, man. Let's go. <laughs> I just I just love the name of the podcast, right? <laughs> I do. It's, it's so good. Um, Thank you. But I think, 
I think what's mysterious to adults who are not, who are just normal parents and don't have pedagogical backgrounds, meaning they don't know about the art and science of teaching, you, you wonder, well, well, what's the difference between financial literacy and civics and, and say, uh, calculus or biology? Hmm. Well, calculus, math, algebra, and biology, those are technical skills. They don't care about your opinion or your right. own personal values. Calculus right. is calculus. Algebra is algebra. Quadratic formulas are quadratic formulas. But financial literacy is the ability to make decisions and and an understanding of who you are as a person. So let's talk about stock investing. Uh, my son, a few years ago, when he was a senior, he took a class in in personal finance that was offered by our school. And one of the modules was on the stock market. He came home and he was really excited. Dad, we're doing you know, the stock market. And it was garbage because what they did was they gave the kids $100,000 in virtual play money and said, there's a contest. Who could make the most money in three months in the stock market wins a prize? Oh, oh wow. Okay. So now that basically says throw everything that we know about value-based investing out the window. Yeah, right. Right. Go. You might as well go to Vegas and roll red seven and see what happens. And then I had to explain, you know, long, you know, he'd be like, this is how we buy stocks. Right. And I'm like, that's not how your mom and I buy stocks. Right. That's not how we manage our investment portfolio. Such it is. And, 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 and then I started to talk to him about Chris, what do you actually care about? Right. And like, well, what do you mean, dad? I'm like, well, when you're making an investment in a company, every investment can be classified in two dimensions. One is the financial return that you're seeking. Uh, seeking. And the second is, what is the impact of investing in that company? It, do you want to invest in a uh, tobacco company? Do you want to invest in a oil company? Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to invest in uh, Beyond Meat, which is plant based proteins. Uh, and I'm not trying to make a moral statement about how I think things are. I'm trying to point out that everyone in this li who's listening, the moment you've made an investment directly or indirectly, uh, your 401k, your, 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 your index fund, if you have an investment, that investment can be mapped into a financial return and a social impact. And the question is, do you know about yourself enough to know technically, like, for example, your tolerance for risk yep. and socially your desire of what to do with an investment? And that's the same thing that can be said about civics. You can't engage civically unless you've had a chance to reflect on, are you more conservative or less conservative? Are you more liberal? Are there certain rights that you care about. For example, you might care about uh, the climate or right. you might care about animal rights. And now you start to realize that your financial choices and your civic choices, uh, the, the, the candidates you support, the bills that you support, the, the beliefs that you have are part of being a member of our society. And right. our, I'm, I'm proud to say that we've just released our curriculum since the last time we talked. We just released our financial literacy curriculum. Nice. Uh, and people can go to firstroot.co and they can see it. And, and one of the lessons is that uh, we've actually split our treatment of investing into two lessons. One lesson is about the factual structure of stocks and bonds and mutual funds. It's just the facts. What's a stock? Right. Then the second lesson talks about the skill required to compare investments and the personal dispositions that a person has in making a stock investment. And some people don't care about uh, the, the social aspect of the stock, and that's okay. They just want a financial return. I'm, I'm fine with that if, as long as you're making that decision consciously. Consciously. Yeah, because as far as I'm concerned, uh, an investment in stock is a vote. You're voting for that concept or that product or that thing. And, and if it doesn't align with your values, I, I, just like you were saying earlier, Luke, I, I won't invest in weaponry. I won't invest in uh, 
tobacco. I won't invest in things that I think are harmful. And I also, I'm pretty bad about this. Well, I'm not bad. My father-in-law laughs all the time because I'm like, well, we're kind of not going to that particular place. Why not? We, I want to go eat there. Well, because they don't treat gay people very well. And he just starts laughing. He goes, you, you know, they are not going to notice that you're not there. And I said, no, but I'll notice that yes. we're eating there. And my daughter will notice. And I would appreciate if you would not take her there when you have her by yourself, which he often does. Right. Right? No, I, and, and I think that just, just that subtle thing is, now, let, now for all the listeners, let's actually point out something that's really important. Alex and I are fathers. And for those of you who are parents on, on the call, and for those of you who, who, who may want to be parents, you have to realize that life skills start the moment the child is born. Yeah. Technical skills tend to start when they're being formally educated, either by their parents or by the school. But literally, life skills start when you're born because as you talk and as the child ages, they are hearing what you're talking about. And by now, your, your daughter has heard you talk about how you feel about equitable representations of other minority communities. Um, the LGBTQ community, for example, and uh, or how you feel about money and how you talk about money. That's all been going on. And we know that the first documented financial event in a child's life is around the age of two when the child makes a purchase request. Mom or dad, would you buy me this? And this <laughs> is usually a food item, like a cereal or a food. Yeah. Yeah. And what's really interesting is, you know, you, you, if you may remember, you take your kid to the farmer market or you take your kid to the to the grocery store and around the age four, they're fidgety and you're an exasperated parent. So you you try to solve the problem by getting them involved. Like I remember going to the farmer's market with my kids and just to keep them occupied, I'd say, like, here's some apples. Here's five bucks. Go buy the apples. And that would get one of my kids involved. But what I was actually doing was teaching the core concepts of a financial transaction with this thing called money. Yeah. You know, you know what, Luke, uh, I wanted to tell you this. I don't know if I mentioned this previously. Speaking of farmer's market, you remind me. So my daughter's 12. And she, this is this is interesting what you're saying about maybe she's picked stuff up from her mother and I all this time. So six months ago, she says, I want to make some money. And I'm like, we'll do some chores and we'll, you know. She goes, no, I want to make money doing something I love. I said, well, what do you want to do? She says, she says I want to get the, the components and put together earrings and I want to sell them online at, with an Etsy store and maybe in person somewhere. Six months later, uh, just about every other Saturday, um, she's at the local farmer's market, has a booth and she sells earrings and that's her money. That's her mad money. Although we do not make, well, yeah, we do. We make her save some of it. But, no, the but point being, even making her save some of it is an appropriate lesson and, 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 it, you know, my, my feeling is my kids are told that they have to save some of the money that they make, which is, in a sense, their money. But it's part of building uh, habits that create disciplines. I mean, you, you know, no one, no, no human is going to spontaneously brush their teeth, right? <laughs> but, 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 when, <laughs> I mean, when, when, you, when you compare it to that kind of a thing, you, you remember when, when your kids were young, you established a pattern of the bedtime routine. Right. Okay, what do we do when we go to bedtime? We have a bath, we brush our teeth, we read a book, we go to bed. And, but that routine, now my kids are old enough now, right? They don't take a bath or shower, you know, they, they do that when they want, but the habit of the teeth brushing has now been ingrained. They brush their teeth in the morning, they brush their, right? It's, and so I think the, the, the starting a habit and maintaining a habit are two very different activities. And to start a habit of saving some of your money, that's an appropriate role for a parent to play by saying, yes, you've earned your money, but here are the restrictions on this. And then, you know, now my kids, it's funny. Sometimes I joke that, especially for two of my kids, um, the habit is a little strong. And, and one of our kids were like, you're supposed to spend money every now and then. Like you've been working all summer. You can enjoy it. No, dad, I'm not going to spend it. Wow. Or he'll, or he'll be like, he'll be like, ah, oh, let's go do this. 
and and we'll be like yeah he'll be like let's go get ice cream and i'm like okay he's like are you paying i'm like okay <laughs> uh, i see what you're doing there i'm like if you want to go get ice cream then everyone buys their own he's like i don't want to go <laughs> oh wow <laughs> but he's <laughs> He's scamming me. I don't mind, but he's good at it too. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and I'm in. I'm as they say. If, if as they say in the in the field, I'm an easy mark. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but I think it's appropriate, and it's of course what's really exciting is your your daughter is learning how to manage her own money, and and you can easily extend that lesson. I'm sure uh, you've thought about this if uh, haven't done it. Like. Okay, well, what are your cost of supplies? What, yeah. how, what's, what's your profit? And little things like that last an entire life. Even if she doesn't decide to become an entrepreneur, she might follow in your footsteps and 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 be, you know work in marketing, work in the mm-hmm. broad field of marketing. She's right. going to be a better marketing person at any company she works for or with because she understands what it meant to run a little business when she was you know 11 and 12 it's a hoot too luke because uh, she needed some um, funds to uh, broaden her product line she wanted to start hand painting some stuff too and she didn't have the money on hand so i said well you got to find yourself an angel investor and her long story short her, her mother and i now each have uh, 15 dollars stock certificates oops i'm making my my video coming in and out uh, we each have these stock certificates and uh, uh because we invested in the company and so she's getting to understand that uh oh wait so you you guys gave me money and but you got we i have to pay it back i'm like yeah uh, preferably with a profit so i'm yeah. explaining the whole, the whole thing right but but i just love that it's it's really not a hard way to uh to teach your kids and so so and, and that's in micro so in macro with uh with P, with pb and what you're doing um but here's a tough question for you okay because sure. i know because here you were trying to get this going in schools all over the country uh right in all of the world really eventually yes. what what do you do though and I, i'm saying this because i just spoke to a school uh, executive two days ago what do you do when they are so swamped just dealing with uh, angry parents about having to wear a mask or vaccine requirements or ridiculous stuff like critical race theory opposition that you know all of these tempests that are so on right in front of their face how do you come in with something like this and get their attention well i gotta tell you that this is where you 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 really feel for school teachers and school administrators when yeah. you talk to them and you see what they deal with you know, and as much as I like to think I'm one of the quote unquote good people, good parents, sure. you know, from their perspective, I'm just a guy coming in, pushing his thing called participatory budgeting and financial <laughs> literacy. He's like, oh, great. You know, another one. Right. So, so, so I think there's a couple of things that uh, strategies that I use. And, and this is important because we're out raising funds right now through an equity crowdfunding platform. And and sometimes people ask me this, like, how do you deal with this, Luke? How are you going to be successful as an ed tech company? And I tell them a couple of things. Sometimes they don't like to hear the answer, but this is the truth. And the first one is patience, right? They're, we're making a sale right. to a, a, a context that is designed to be conservative. Uh, and that's schools who don't want to make fast changes to... Right. Uh, to their to their students. So so the first thing is to be patient because we know that participatory budgeting is growing. For example, in New York City, Mayor De Blasio now is is supporting participatory budgeting in schools. We're seeing uh, the University of Illinois in Chicago just published a toolkit about participatory budgeting. New York City has its own curriculum about civics. We're seeing the growth of participatory budgeting in schools. So there's this, there, it, it, it's popping, if you will. Right. The second thing is to realize that uh, you have to speak to the schools listening. And I'm working on a kit, Alex, so that people like you and, and other parents who want to give this a, a go uh, can go to firstroot.co and get a kit that helps them introduce this into schools. So a couple of things that are required. First, Schools need to know that this is going to align to the common core or other educational requirements. So Mm -hmm. one of the exciting things about the University of Chicago toolkit is it shows how 
participatory budgeting aligns to the common core educational standards for literacy and arts and critical thinking. This is really important because for better or for worse, our schools are dealing with the No Child Left Behind Act. They're dealing with uh, the fact that they have to teach to the standards and they need curriculum that aligns to standards. So we are also building out our curriculum to align to state standards where relevant. And when the state standards are not relevant, there's a fantastic organization called jumpstart.org. Uh, and hmm. Jumpstart defines financial literacy standards for educational materials. They don't create the educational materials, but if you create educational materials in personal finance, they give you a set of standards to adhere to which kind of creates a nice opportunity for educators to know that they're getting a standards-based curriculum. I think the third thing is to really uh, look at all of the allies and all the stakeholders yeah. that exist. There's PTAs, there's uh, corporate social responsibility programs. We've got a program right now with Salesforce at a high school in San Mateo. We've got a program with the Rotary Club of Sunnyvale sponsoring a school in Sunnyvale. We've got a program with Lucid, a company who, that does Lucid Charts, which is an online, really wonderful collaboration platform in Provo, Utah. So what we're starting to see is uh, uh, companies are starting to realize if our society is not civically engaged, our companies are harmed. Yeah. And I'll, I'll leave one more thing. There's a recent report in McKinsey, we, maybe we should add it to the show notes, where McKinsey says that closing the wealth gap will create two and a half to four trillion dollars of GDP improvement. Now Whoa. you go to any business leader and you say, would you like to see two and a half to four trillion dollars of additional beneficial economic activity? They're gonna say yes. Yeah. And when you say, how do we do that? Uh, and you say, by promoting financial equity, it's going to create that kind of impact. That's amazing. So when you get people like you and me saying this is important, business leaders may go, yeah, it's Alex and Luke. Who are they? <laughs> right. But when you get McKinsey yeah. saying to business leaders, this is an important issue. And here's the interesting thing. Financial equity creates opportunity for everyone. Yeah. It's not that we're raising the benefit of poor people at the expense of rich people. Right. Everyone benefits. You, you know, it's, it's like you read my mind because I was getting ready to ask you. I was going to say, okay, so Luke, we talked about this before. I want to bring this to the school system where my kid's at. Um, but I was going to ask you, would it be beneficial if I went to one of my former clients, which is a local bank, and said, Hey, will you get on board with me? What do you think? Do you want? To? Because I felt like that's the thing, right? If you can get a, a local bank or a local company that's that's involved, I mean, the superintendent or whomever I'm speaking to is going to pay a lot more attention to me, aren't they? So that's what is that kind of what you're just talking about? That's it. And and we've had some good luck at at First Root, especially with uh, one of the investors who was on the fence, and I just said. Look, you're a business leader. Yeah, I'm a business leader, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, do you want to see GDP improve? Yeah, I want to see GDP better at, you know, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, great, here's a report from McKinsey. And he and he just stopped stone cold silent. And he was he was like, and he just he just simply said, So you're telling me if if we improve equity and financial equity, my company is gonna benefit. He's a construction guy. I'm like, well, I can't prove the direct correlation, but the GDP is normally associated with the construction industry. <laughs> right. So I think you're gonna I think you're gonna benefit. He's like, okay. So so <laughs> okay, right. So he's also Cookie Monster, by the way. Yeah, he's like okay, <laughs> cookies. Right? Um he did sound a little bit like Cookie Monster now to, to come and think about it. But the, the point is, is that when you and I and people like us are talking about this impact, we are talking about a beneficial impact for society. And we right. mean that as inclusively as we possibly can. Right. That's important. 
It's it's hugely important. And what what I like about this is that you're you know, you're arming um, supporters with stuff because I think what you said, but you're too nice to say. When you go to a lot of business people, you can just see it sometimes in their face. Oh, this is some kind of squishy liberal. Yeah. thing that's gonna get your hand out of my pocket dude i don't you know and that's not what this is about at all and then you got mckinsey as you said and folks if you don't know who mckinsey is they're like one of the premier uh business consulting firms in the world and uh trust me business owners listen to to this kind of stuff so so i so i love that luke um in the moments we have left here and i, I this has gone so fast that i uh, i'm so sad to see that go so fast but uh I, what do you think um parents can do in the interim if what if they're like you said earlier there's a lot of parents who think this is a great idea but they're just making a living they don't have time like like i did and blessed with the the wherewithal to get a civics uh, curriculum and do it during lockdown it, what can they do to make things a little better is is it is it simply in your opinion a matter of doing what what you can with the pta is it what is it they can do well, if, if I take the most abstract point of view and I don't worry about any kind of beneficial things for first route, one of the things that we know again from research is that any parental involvement in the school is good. Like it's almost impossible to have bad parental involvement. It can be challenging, it can be contentious, but it's not bad, okay. right? Because even, even contentious debate about what to teach and not to teach can have a beneficial effect on um, building coalitions if the conversations are respectful. Now there are, there are better ways and 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 less and more effective ways to express your opinion, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes we've seen parents be pretty horrific about about being rude with other parents, but if they do yeah. it respectfully, it, it tends to be good. My my recommendation is is to just kind of meet parents where they are. Because it doesn't matter if you're uh, a low or moderate or wealthy, uh, you know, low moderate income uh, school or a wealthy school, all parents, regardless of their socioeconomic status, want their children to succeed. Right. So one of the things that a parent can do, and, and by definition, if they're listening to the podcast or can they refer people to this podcast and get it, more people listening to it, is they can uh, do uh, any number of things. They could make a a, do, a contribution to their PTA. It doesn't have to be economic. It can be donate two hours on a Saturday yeah, on, or a Sunday. Uh, it could be uh, uh, support. Uh, if Let's say you're, you're a parent who has a young child and you have to be at home when your child is at home after school. Well, take one more child into your house and then free up that parent so that they could go contribute to the school. So sometimes the way parents can help is not by directly showing up or directly giving money, but by helping other parents do that work by, you know, managing kids or doing whatever. So I would say that the, the, the most basic thing is to find a way to get involved in the school. And and a great way to do that is through the Parent Teacher Association or PTO, PTA, et cetera. And, and you're also modeling behavior, right, as we discussed. Your, your kids are going to see that you're involved and you care. Um, you, even though they may be, as my kid is, grossly embarrassed that I'm, I'm at the school, that I exist within the walls <laughs> of the school. <laughs> but well, you know, when, by the way, that, that changes. When your kids are like between uh, kindergarten and fifth grade, remember how they liked us? A oh, and yeah. then. And then when they hit middle school, they start to separate. When puberty right. hits, the kids separate. But what you're going to find is they're going to ask you back in high school. So my kids who are now in high school and through high school, they want you to come back. They want you to attend. Um, what, what happens in high school is the kids tend to start to pick their own clubs. Mm -hmm. So one of, my one of my kids was in water polo in the debate club. Another is in choir. A third is in dance. So they start to say, hey, would you come to the water polo game? Would you come to the choir concert? So you get to go back and be a parent, and it's cool again. It's just that middle school where the kids start to separate from parents, but they come back. And they're, they're supposed to. This is not – They're a, supposed yeah. to. 
Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to lie. When she was in third or fourth grade, uh, I came and spoke to her class about writing a book. And uh, they, she moved up to middle school. And I said, oh, I, you think you, you might want me to come back and talk about writing books? And she's like, no. And if you do, I'll not speak to you for a week. And I said, okay. okay. Right, right, yeah. right. But I get that. I get that. Well, let's, uh, the last thing, too. I'm, I'm sorry, Luke. I, I'm, I am taking you away from no, your, no, your vital okay. work. <laughs> I want to know. Um, how to invest in first root. I want to help. I, again, I'm not a wealthy person, but I would like to write a check somehow. Is there, is there a way a, a guy like me can do that? Yeah, there's, there's, we are doing something that is philosophically aligned with our company's values called equity crowdfunding investing. Hmm. So it's where you can, it, so it, many people on the, uh, on the podcast are familiar with say Kickstarter or Indiegogo where you have, you have a crowd of people funding a product. Well, what if instead of a crowd of people funding a product, we had a crowd of people funding a company by buying shares in a pre IPO company. Hmm. And so the, the stock market is the, the way that you buy, you know, the, you can buy stock in Apple or, or, or Tesla or Google or whatever. What we did is we did equity crowdfunding, which is a new regulation that was introduced a few years ago where our company got reviewed by the SEC. They looked at all of our books, made sure everything was in order, and we're now selling equity in our company to the, to, to the public, to people like you. And that equity is, is actually owning a piece of first route. And to get to that website, so we have to go through a registered process to go through this. You can get to it by going to firstroot.co and then clicking on the invest in first route. Now, the company that we're using to uh, manage our investment is one of the few companies that's by law permitted to do this uh, because they have to be registered with the SEC. And that's a company called Net Capital. Hmm. So uh, if you go to netcapital.com, you can find First Root. Or if you go to First Root, we provide a link to Net Capital. And anyone on this phone call can invest for, I, I'm not allowed to like uh, say the details of the financial terms, but anyone on this phone call can invest for less than what they would cost them to take a family of four out to dinner. Uh, and and I, I'm not bound by any restrictions, but I'm not going to say it either. I'm just yeah. going to tell you, I'm looking at it right now. And yeah, there's, I was gonna, getting ready to say, that's a pretty nice dinner. Not even, well, it's a pretty nice dinner. It's not even like a fancy dinner for, for a family of four. That's just everybody getting getting more than burger and fries. That's a pretty great thing. Now, there is, I, okay, I can say this, though. If you're interested, uh, there is a deadline. I can say that, right, Luke? I oh, yes, you true. can say, yeah. They, if people are interested in owning a piece of first route, uh, the deadline is October 20th. I, I can share the deadline. And I can also share it's really exciting is that we've had investors from quite literally around the world. I've, we've had people in India, in uh, Latin America, in Europe, across America invest. And it's really, truly fulfilling the vision of a crowd investment. Um, uh, and what's exciting for me is we're building a coalition of people who really care about financial literacy and civics. And we're gonna use that as our springboard to reach lots of schools because imagine how you're gonna behave, Alex, once you're an investor. You're gonna to wanna to see this company succeed Absolutely. because that way when we do go public, it'll be worth a, a, you know money that we can uh, pay you back or one day sell your shares in the, in the IPO market. Uh, that's something else. And uh, folks, just go to firstroot.co. There'll be links in the show notes at mgopod.com. Luke, I would be remiss if I didn't give you the final word here other than on my part just to say thank you so much for sharing this. And, and beyond sharing it with this show and my other show, thank you for what you're doing. I believe in what you're doing, and I don't know if you get many backpats for this uh, work, but you deserve a lot of them, a lot of attaboys. So c congrats on that. Uh, but I'll leave you with the, the final word. I'm just going to say thanks for having me. I, uh, I, I appreciate your smile, your good humor, uh, the fact that you're doing this even after. Uh, I had that experience once too. Once in my life, I cracked a tooth through biting on a seed the wrong way, and it was awful. So I appreciate you for, for, for charging ahead, and I thank you for all the listeners 
uh, we really appreciate your support. You know, I love podcasting. I have since 2006, back when you had to use like a Dixie cup with string to make the thing work. And that's why I'm so excited that we recently moved Mysterious Goings On to Anchor FM to record our podcast. I got to tell you, I don't regret it a bit. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. First of all, it's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. And you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. Not going to lie to you, when I first heard about Anchor, I was a little dubious because I've been doing it the hard way for so long. But I got to tell you, it's very easy. Use a Stripe account get sponsors you're not paying monthly hosting fees the sound quality is great the distribution is phenomenal friends download the free anchor app today if you want to start your own podcast or go to anchor.fm to get started remember you heard it here first on mysterious goings on Okay, who has a podcast then writes an ebook about podcasting and doesn't do an audiobook version of it? Well, not me. I've done that. In fact, I'm very excited to tell you, dear listeners, that the podcast option, my recent top selling ebook on podcasting, my journey through 15 years as a podcaster, broadcaster, host, guest, and observer, is now an audible audiobook. It's really, really, really exciting for me to be able to present this to you through Audible, uh, which is available on Amazon.com, where the ebook link is as well. And in this fast listen, my experience uh, comes to you through stories, practical tips and advice from my hundreds of hours as a guest, producer, podcast host, and more. And the podcast option, if I say so myself, is mandatory listening for those new to podcasting, and it should be a welcome addition to veteran podcasters library. So... Check out the podcast option read by yours truly, Alex Greenwood, or as they say there, the J. Alexander Greenwood, because that's my pen name, and that's a long story, which if you dig through my podcast, eventually you'll find out what that means. But the point being today, the podcast option is available now as an audible audiobook. I've got a link in the show notes to make it easy for you. Please do me a favor, go get that audiobook. Or if audiobooks aren't your bag, there's also a link for you to get it as an ebook. Again, the podcast option. I certainly hope you will choose it. Thanks so much for listening to Mysterious Goings On. Don't forget we have a complete archive of all of our interviews, monologues, updates, live readings, dead readings. All of that stuff is available at mgopod.com. And, of course, don't forget to subscribe to us so you never miss an episode. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all the usual suspects. Please join us there. Again, don't forget, mgopod.com also has links where to find me on social media and how to get in touch in case you want to be a guest here on the show. Well, I think it's time that I move on for this week, but until next time, keep reading.